everybody. My name is Ike, <coughs> Ike Nahum, and on behalf of the October 25 Free the Five Organizing Committee, my job is to call this gathering to order. Before introducing our chairpersons, I want to briefly address our theme tonight, U.S.-Cuban relations and the case of the Cuban Five. <clears throat> the case of the Cuban Five is the perfect encapsulation of U.S.-Cuban relations. The U.S. government in the early 1990s genuinely believed that the Cuban Revolution could not possibly survive the economic, financial, and political consequences of the rapid collapse of the former Soviet bloc governments with which Cuba carried out some 85% of its economic exchange. As the Cuban economy practically fell off a cliff, Washington, circling for the kill under the uh, Democratic Clinton White House with full bipartisan consensus in Congress, tightened the decades-long economic sanctions further and under the new Torricelli and Helms-Burton uh, legislation pressured the world to acquiesce to a, to a U.S. blockade. But Cuba fought back. In order to gain urgently needed foreign exchange and maintain free medical care and free education, the Cuban government began to rebuild its tourism industry with quick and accumulating success. U.S.-based Cuban-American organizations with long records of violence and terrorist assaults against Cuba were, um, uh, began to target this tourist sector. Bombs were set off at tourist hotels. An Italian tourist was murdered. Cuban territorial airspace was repeatedly violated with low-flying aircraft dropping propaganda and other material and practically practicing for God knows what else in the future, if they got away with it. Plots and attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro and other Cuban leaders were put in motion again. The U.S. government turned a blind eye at best to all of this. That is, this is why the Cuban Five were dispatched to South Florida. This is why they risked their lives to protect the Cuban economy, the Cuban people, foreign tourists, and all the achievements of the Cuban Revolution. It is a fact that the heroic acts of the Cuban Five thwarted plots and saved lives. The fight to free Antonio, Gerardo, and Ramon, who remain behind bars and are part of the Cuban Five, including uh, of Antonio Guerrero, Fernando Gonzalez, Gerardo Hernandez, Ramon Labanino, and Rene Gonzalez, is totally intertwined with any future motion to end all U.S. economic, financial, and travel sanctions against the island of Cuba and for the full normalization of diplomatic relations between Washington and Havana. Think about it. We are meeting here tonight towards the end of 2014. The Cuban Revolution triumphed on January 1st, 1959. U.S. sanctions against Cuba began in 1960-61 towards the end of the Dwight Eisenhower and beginning of the John Kennedy White Houses. That is before many of you here were even born and maybe before, for some of the students that are here, maybe even before your parents were born. And this anti-Cuba policy continues today. An unbroken continuity from Eisenhower through Obama. The longest unchanged policy in U.S. diplomatic history but it is considerably weakened today. The fact is that UN anti-Cuba sanctions and hostility are utterly isolated in today's world and are in effect in, in permanent political crisis. Next week, the UN General Assembly will, for the 23rd year in a row, vote near unanimously to condemn the US economic and financial embargo. Cuba's selfless and heroic vanguard initiatives to fight the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, a policy in total continuity with decades of Cuba's political, military, and medical solidarity with African liberation and development, <laughs> including the decisive contribution of Cuban troops in the military defeat of racist South Africa and the evaporation of the apartheid state have amazed and filled the world with love and admiration once again. At the same time, the churlishness 
of anti-US policy is filling the world with scorn and disdain. Today, Washington is certainly paying a political price for its continuing anti-Cuba policies and sanctions. Our job is to make the political price so high as to make it unbearable for the US rulers. The US rulers have no moral authority to lecture Cuba about human rights and civil liberties. Contemporary US society is totally dominated by a class biased, obscenely unequal, and racist criminal justice system with its mass incarceration, its stop and frisk, its cop killings regularly of innocent and unarmed youth, usually African American, with almost never any consequences, and so on. This reality will be registered in our program tonight. We are honored to have with us tonight brothers Youssef Salam and Raymond Santana, two of the Central Park Five frame up victims. And Iris Baez and Juanita Young, two courageous women and mothers whose children were gunned down by NYPD with no consequences. Our two co chairs tonight are Sister Gail Walker, co director of IFCO Pastors for Peace, and Cesar Sanchez, a leader of the July 26th coalition and creator of all the works of art that publicize our events such as the beautiful palm card used to build tonight's evening of solidarity. Now let me also, uh, on behalf of the committee, give a special thanks to our brother uh, and John Jay professor and Reverend Luis Barrios, also a co-director of IFCO Pastors for Peace, and to Jacqueline Nieves, the administrative coordinator of the Department of Latin American and Latina, Latino Studies here at John Jay, who facilitated the work to make this event happen. And a special thanks to the crew that got and prepared the food for tonight's reception, Rosemary Mealy, Sam Anderson, Sarah Waldman, and Aaron uh, Feely Nahum. Before Gail and Cesar take over, I would like to ask everyone to stand for a moment of silence to, sp to three special friends who passed this year. All were supporters of the Cuban Revolution and the cause of the Cuban Five. The first two are both Nobel Prize winning authors and novelists, exemplary human beings and political activists. The unforgettable Gabriel Garcia Marquez of Colombia and also the wonderful Nadine Gordimer, an unsurpassed chronicler of her beloved South Africa and its peoples in the cauldron and hell of apartheid. And finally, closer to home, our brother Norman Hodgett, a tireless activist and fighter for social justice for over six decades, mostly in New York City, who was always there whenever anything needed to be done in solidarity with Cuba or any other just cause. We would like to dedicate this meeting to Norman's memory. Thank you. Please welcome Gail Walker and Cesar Sanchez. Okay. Well, I'd like to extend um, our welcome uh, on behalf of uh, IFCO, the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization, and I know uh, the July 26 coalition. Um, Cesar and I are pleased to be able to be here to help um, moderate uh, tonight's uh, events. But thank you all for being here. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to learn and uh, continue to share information about the important uh, work and efforts that are being undertaken to continue to educate uh, people here in the United States and indeed worldwide about the case of the Cuban Five. And, um, we're grateful for those of you who will be here to share and uh, ex expand upon uh, the base of knowledge that uh, we've been able to uh, garner around this case. I'd like to welcome to the podium now um, a dear friend, a colleague, brother, uh, uh, one of IFCO's uh, directors, uh, community activists, a liberation theologian, um, 
Professor Luis Barrios, uh, who, as you all know, is a um, hellraiser and um, a passionate, uh, a passionate fighter for justice. Father Luis Barrios. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Buenas noches. Good evening. It's good to be here. Welcome to John Jay College of Criminal Justice. We're still trying to change the name. <laughs> so that's another story. <laughs> Why here? That was a question from the administration. And we were so happy that they were concerned. We like to make people concerned, especially about that issue. So, well, why here? Why not here? Yeah. You've been saying that we are in the journey or in the business, the way they call it, of educating for justice. So that's what we're doing here tonight. We're just educating for justice. Uh, and that, in that particular context, we want to talk about these five, I still say young men, and I want to I just want to stay like that. There's five young men. Uh, but from not just the, the legal construction of crime, uh, we're going to have the lawyer here, and they know a lot about this, OK? So but you're going to hear people talking about the social construction of crime that went against these five men, the political construction of crime that went against the five men here, OK? Uh, so, we want to put it in that particular context, but also I want to just highlight in these uh, two or three minutes that I have, another context that I really enjoy, you know, I'm a priest, so that's also what I do for business. So, they are heroes, so Nuestro Héroe, but I, I like to call them prophets, profetas, in the theological language. Why? Because in every single sacred book that deals with the terminology of prophet, prophets have three responsibilities. One, identify problems. Oh, they, they, they know how to do that. But that is, do not stop there. After you identify problems, you do something more radical. You denounce the problems. You have to uh, destroy the silence. You have to say something against injustice. They know how to do that. And then they go into the third level, which is the most difficult one. You need to do something to change the problem. Not just talking, doing. That's why they are in prison. For doing, not for talking, okay? They did what they were supposed to do. Now it's your responsibility and my responsibility to get them out of prison, send them home. Amen. Achei. Gracias. Our next guest speaker is the president of the Coalition of Concern of Medical Professional, uh, amazing individual, challenging public health policy in the United States, also a publication of vital signs up here, you know, talks about all the healthcare happening in the community. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Stevens. Thank you. It is my honored task, actually, to introduce uh, the next speaker. But to do so, I feel it's very important to locate his presence here tonight among us in the context not only of the heroism of his five comrades, but in the heroism and fraternity of Cuba's latest mission in service to the poor and working people of the world. I'm referring, of course, to Cuba's present undertaking to fight the Ebola virus, now raging through the impoverished people of Western Africa. Among the ranks of Cuba's very fine medical doctors are the world's leading experts on tropical disease. However, tropical disease as a term is, is really a euphemism for 
diseases of poverty, diseases of extreme poverty. As we know, here in the United States, those who live and those who die is purely a matter of their economic and social standing in a society. More than 4,500 people have died from Ebola so far. Nearly 10,000 have contracted the virus. According to the World Health Organization, Ebola is currently predicted to increase at a pace, if not contained, whereby there will be 10,000 cases a week in Western Africa by December, one month away. <clears throat> Only a country with a truly equitable healthcare delivery system, one that trains its physicians in the biological and the psychological and the social diseases, and also a country that bases its foreign policy on outspoken and consistent humanitarianism is suited to lead this fight. <clears throat> there are many countries who have money, who have the equipment, who have vast stores of supplies, medications, and manpower, but it is my view, and I'm sure one that you share, that those countries must justly fall in behind the leadership of Cuba in this battle. Even the New York Times says so. The Times this week contrasted the role of Cuba in confronting the disease to that of the world's richest nations. And I'm quoting, while the United States and several other wealthy countries have been happy to pledge funds, only Cuba and a few non-governmental organizations are offering what is most needed medical professionals in the field. The United States government has agreed to spend $400 million to build at least a dozen hundred bed field hospitals <clears throat> using some 400,000 military soldiers to do so while having deployed uh, 65 health officials to date to Western Africa. However, new facilities alone that lack the healthcare workers to staff them will not stop the disease. And while financial aid and support like food and security have trickled into the region from the world, <clears throat> the world must wake up to the threat that's posed by Ebola because human resources are what are most urgently needed. Quoting Dr. Margaret Chan, the head of the World Health Organization, Money and materials are important, but those two things alone cannot stop the Ebola virus. She said, we need most especially compassionate doctors and nurses willing to work under very demanding conditions. Two months ago, the administration of Cuban President Raul Castro briefly announced its readiness to send teams of medical doctors, nurses, technicians, to help battle the scourge that was spreading. With technical support from the World Health Organization, the Cuban government has so far trained for this special task 460 doctors and nurses on the very stringent precautions that must be taken to treat people with this extremely contagious disease. The first group of 165 arrived in Sierra Leone and Jose Luis de Fabio, the World Health Organization's representative in Havana, said that Cuban medical personnel were uniquely suited for this task because many had already worked in Africa. Three days ago, two other brigades were dispatched, 200 health professionals from Cuba whose leaders were already in the field dispatched for Liberia and Guinea. I understand there are some 15,000 medical professionals in Cuba who have singularly volunteered also to go. <laughs> According to the World Health Organization, Sierra Leone alone will need 10,000 health professionals in the field to stop the disease. This past week, Cuba organized a regional summit to address this issue was held in Havana. The implications of the virus were taken up by Cuba and ALBA, and they were responding to a call put out by the United Nations to unite international efforts. 
The summit did determine some collective proposals to take on the fight to help in training healthcare personnel, designing and implementing comprehensive and effective preventive measures, giving a priority, of course, to the region's most vulnerable states. At the same time, they invited the countries of North America to join in the cooperative effort. I would like to note that for this hemisphere and the arsenal that we in the Americas have to deploy towards this fight, there are 45,952 Cuban healthcare workers in 25 countries in the Americas. 23,158 of them are physicians who, along with their colleagues from the continent, make up a very powerful force to meet this challenge. There are also 23,944 physicians who have graduated from Cuban universities currently on duty in their own countries building health systems as they were taught in Cuba. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it is in this framework that I have the honor to introduce to you a veteran of another great mission to Africa, an internationally recognized leader in true human rights, a comrade and a friend, His Excellency, Rodolfo Reyes. Well, I, I would like to express our very deep gratitude for all of you. I think that I uh, recognize uh, at the entrance so many friends, so many people that are people committed to both causes. I think that I'm not so sure that we need to be educated for justice because I think that most of those that are here, I think that are fighting for social justice. But I think that it is very important that we are together that, uh, that we are in this place uh, to join uh, the efforts and to join the cause that we are representing in different areas. I think that here there are so many uh, fighters for justice in the area on the fight against racism, in the fight for provide, uh, so, uh, provide health care and to provide uh, social assistance for all that are in need. Particularly also there are so many that has been providing solidarity to Cuba. The Cuban Revolution that I don't think that we uh, consider ourselves a perfect society. We are in a very deep process of uh, uh, trying to be doing more efficient, to be doing more effective, to be more humane, to be also more democratic. I think that we are trying to have more socialism and to have more justice and to have more freedom and to have also at the same time keeping that kind of very deep principles and values that has been from the very beginning of the revolution being the flag that has been raised by Fidel Castro and Raul Castro. And that has been also a symbol in a de de very difficult circumstances that has been a symbol for our region and for so many friends when we have been fighting and when we have been in different areas, also uh, has been said here, in Africa fighting apartheid, uh, in Africa fighting for independence against colonial regimes, in, in some cases like uh, former Portuguese colonies, that we have been also been fighting for, uh, uh, for life, our doctors, our nurses, our medical staff, also to be fighting illiteracy that has been also our teachers and also that has been fighting uh, that kind of, of very important uh, elements that I think that are the real problem of the world and that are avoiding that we move forward for this uh, better world that we consider that should be the case for, the, uh, for all of us. I would like, on behalf of Cuba, on behalf of the, uh, every member of the Cuban people to express our thanks for what you are doing. I think that to break the silence in the case of the Cuban Five has been very important. I think that has been referred here that 
in some cases also our heroes that we consider and think that they deserve. It's not that it's so easy in Cuba to have that gift to be considered a hero. Because I would like to recognize that our, the majority, the very vast majority of Cubans are heroes. They have been fighting the special period that was very difficult at the time of the collapse of the Soviet <laughs> Union. They have been fighting all those obstacles that has been imposed by embargo. And I, I would like to apologize myself because I need to leave at eight because uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs is coming today, uh, today at nine to be here in the voting on the resolution against the blockade that is going to be taking place on Tuesday. <laughs> and that is very clear that that kind of respect and recognition to Cuba uh, is really wide. And also uh, in different parts of the world, we have that kind of signs of sympathy, solidarity, support. That has been not so easy in US. And particularly, I think that we have been always trying to be breaking walls and to be also breaking all this uh, propaganda that has been fabricated uh, on the basis of uh, elements, allegations that are not true, or manipulation, and every kind of element that has been tried. And this is one of the cases. Has been, in the, uh, in the beginning, uh, expressed clearly what our five brothers has been doing here in the US. They has been, uh, most of them, because has been not the case of Gerardo and Fernando, but most of them has been fathers. They have fa families, they are relatives, and they, has been, they are really well-educated people. For them, it will, uh, it, that was uh, better to stay in Cuba and to enjoy life in a society when you have opportunities to realize yourself as a professional. But if they decide, as our daughter that has been referred here, decide to fight the, uh, uh, to fight the death on, in the case of Ebola, because I think that I have a lot of uh, myself, I admire our uh, doctors, our nurses, because it's true, it has been not so easy. And even some very developed and powerful country has been in touch with Cuba because they know that only in Cuba you have that kind of human beings when you can't request to be committed yourself in a cause. Because even some of them, they think that we have been able to be mobilized because of money. Some of them would like to be uh, saying, well, we are going to pay, uh, you said the doctors, we, we are going to pay the amount of money that, that you are going to request. We say no. We are not putting the life of our people because of money. Because if that was the case, we don't have the kind of revolution that we were constructing for so <laughs> many years. Our daughters, our daughters, they moved to Africa only on the basis of very deep conviction, conviction that when you have a human being that is in need, you need even to put your own life in risk. They know they, they were doing this on voluntary basis, even they have that kind of commitment that they need to avoid that all this disease is going to be spread to Cuba, and even they, they are in the readiness, if they are sick, to remain and to be treated there uh, and to avoid that all this is going to be spread. Uh, in Latin America and, uh, and the Caribbean. They are, they are very brave people, and that has been very uh, clear representative of that kind of sense uh, of dignity and that kind of sense of freedom and that kind of sense of social justice that the revolution has been creating and the Cuban people has been educated on the basis of those principles. And that has been the case of our Cuban Five. They went to uh, Florida precisely because that was a, a priority need to try to stop all those terrorist activities that has been committed against our people. That was in a very difficult time. Our uh, revolution, uh, our uh, uh, system, that was very close to be in, a, uh, in no way uh, of future. Uh, most of us, we, uh, we, we need to recognize in that period, even we have a difficulty to get access to food has been people, well, that is the problem. Well, that, that is those cases when, when you have a blackout and, and people now refer that we have no electricity. But ele electricity, that was the minimum. The problem in Cuba is that we had no food at that time. 
and even to ensure that we have the minimum level of nutrition for our people, that was a real fight. That was the reason because we don't like tourism industry. Well, tourist industry that is good for solidarity and when we have people, we have that kind of friendship groups that are going to Cuba and we have that kind of people to people exchanges, that is fine. But if you are going to, to have that kind of tourist industry on the basis of people that have money and they are trying there and uh, I think that that was not the case for the strategy of development of the revolution. But we need at that time to develop the tourist industry because we need to have incomes to be able to buy food and to survive because that was a very difficult time. And precisely at that moment, uh, Americans, no Americans, uh, as uh, I would like to say, that was not the government. I think that some very right-wing and terrorists and, and very hardliners and extremist groups, because we are, uh, and I, I, I used to follow the Western propaganda on that kind of extremist groups in uh, ISIS and all this, but I think that we have so many extremists, not only in Middle East and not only uh, in those cases uh, from any particular religion. I think that we have also that kind of extremist groups in all those that has been designing and has been <coughs> pushing for this kind, uh, that kind of anti-Cuban policy for so many years. And they have been uh, in need to go to Miami and to get information of, of all those groups that were trying to, uh, to destroy our development of the tourist industry because we had cases, we have an Italian that has been killed in a hotel uh, during those days, and when you know that the, in the case of the tourism, no one would like to go to a country that is not safe. And if you would like to decide where you would like to go, and you have Cuba, but you have another uh, places to go, you are not going to, to go to Cuba if your life is going to be put in risk. And they know that, and that is the reason that those terrorist groups, and as a matter of fact, we already, I think that we are trying to, to, to have the release and the freedom for our three heroes that are still on jail. But we have uh, Luis Posada Carriles, that is one of the worst terrorists in the history of this hemisphere, that it have, is, has been granted total impunity. And that is that kind of contrast, that kind of two, uh, uh, two approaches and two ways to be providing justice I don't like to be here to criticize uh, the, uh, the, the system of justice of US. And I think that is up to Americans. No, no, I think that is up to you as Americans to evaluate your own, your own uh, justice system. But to me, it's clear that in the case of Cuba, the, this system do, uh, doesn't apply at all. That in every case, uh, even in, in areas on uh, like Havana Club and Cohibas that has been stored. We have trademarks in Cuba. We have Coca-Cola and all those branches that are fully respected. All those trademarks, they are inscribed in our registers and we are not doing any kind of activity to undermine the respect of that kind of trading uh, and property uh, system and protection on the international law. But even our trademark here has, has been totally stored. And well, what we can wait in the case of those people that has been putting uh, clearly what is the real activities of those terrorist groups in Miami. I think that is a fight that is difficult, as has been also the case of the fight on, uh, against blockade. On Tuesday, I think that we are going to have a very clear support from the international community. I'm not so sure that the American authorities are going to be listening what is going to be the request of the international community, what is going to be the request, even now, of the majority of the Americans that are uh, requesting a change of the U.S. policy on Cuba. But what we cannot keep silence is on when we have an injustice to have three heroes, three human beings that sacrifice themselves to a whole, uh, a, a, a millions of, to save millions of human beings that are ourselves. They are on jail because of me. They are on jail because of all of us that are here from Cuba. They are on jail because of every Cuban, every age, that, uh, that they, they, they were here to seek information to protect us, not to be victims of terrorist activities, not to be victims of the bomb, and also not to be dying because of not getting access to food. 
because I think that you can be uh, uh, you, uh, you can be uh, the victims of a criminal activity not only because someone uh, have that kind of violent activity with you. Also, when like a poor person, you have no access to healthcare system, when you have no food to uh, to have uh, adequate nutrition, when you don't have a uh, housing that is going to be providing you that kind of protection that you need and also to develop your family. It's for all the reason that I think that we never going to surrender in this fight for the truth. We never going to surrender in that kind of activity, uh, working with people like you, that I think that, well, in that case, I don't need to convince you. I think that most of you has been fighting in this particular case for so many years. The only thing that I would like to tell you on behalf of the Cuban people is thank you very much. We always count on you. We always count on you to break the silence. We always uh, count on you to try uh, to convince and to pass that message, that truth, to try to mobilize uh, more other American citizens, American organizations, because I think that the American people have a good heart. I think that if we are able to uh, be able to present the, the case that they can understand, I think that they, they are going to request their authorities to provide the only response that that case uh, uh, is needed. That is the freedom of these three heroes that are still on the Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Deis. Um, I think one of the things that you mentioned that is very important is um, finding ways to expand knowledge about this case. Uh, and not just to, as we often say, um, the uh, converted. <laughs> Those of us who've been working on this, it's, a, it's about getting the, the word out um, further and, and broader and wider. And, and I think that that's the charge. I think that that's the challenge. And that's what we, we need to be about doing. And in that regard, I know that we'll be hearing from um, uh, a younger comrade soon. And I think that that's very important um, that we hear from the youth. And so we'll be uh, having the opportunity to hear from Claudia Mendoza, who's a student here at the school shortly. But I also want to just take a quick moment and um, acknowledge that there are students here from the CUNY Center for Worker Education. Uh, let's see your hands. Thank you all for being here and for um, learning and, sh and, and spreading the word uh, about this case. I'd like to just take a quick moment and read a message of greetings from our friends at ECAP, the Cuban Institute for Friendship with the People. Dearest friends, our first thoughts go to Ramon Antonio and Geraldo, who have been unjustly imprisoned for more than 16 years. The Cuban Institute for Friendship with the People wants to thank all participants who have attended this event today at John Jay College to express their ideas about the U.S.-Cuban relations and the case of the Cuban Five. We express our profound gratitude to all those friends who contributed to the organization of this event that is already another important step in building a wider network in solidarity with Cuba and our three comrades that are still in prison. The number of supporters of the international campaign in solidarity with the Cuban Five has increased during these years and more friends have joined the efforts to organize a varied calendar of events to raise awareness about how people can work to free them. In March, lots of friends attend, uh, added their voices in London while they were at the International Commission of Inquiry into the case of the Cuban Five. The three presiding judges presented their concluding statements after hearing the testimonies of victims of terrorism against Cuba. Their conclusions were sent to President Barack Obama, calling, him, calling on him to grant unconditional pardons to the Five and to release immediately and unconditionally the three who remain in prison. 
During the third five days of the Cuban Five held in Washington, D.C. last June, hundreds of friends gathered in a rally in front of the White House, <coughs> lobbied members of Congress in addition to other initiatives in a number of U.S. cities promoting the truth about this case. In Havana on September 12th, there was another important moment when, where friends from more than 40 countries met the wives, mothers, daughters, and sons of the Cuban Five and have witnessed that 16 years is too long and too much suffering has taken place. We agree that it's time to have them back home with their families. We call on all of you to join our efforts to free Antonio Herrero, uh, Geraldo uh, Hernandez, and Ramon Lavanino today. Thank you for your support. We again express our love and appreciation, all of us at the Cuban Institute of friendship with the people. I'd now like to ask uh, Sister Estela uh, Vasquez, the um, Executive Vice President of one of the nation's most progressive labor unions, 1199 SEIU United Healthcare Workers East, to come forward. Buenas noches, compañeras y compañeros. Good evening, comrades. Um, I have something for you, Luis. Luis say, why here, they ask you. When I came in here, I asked the same question. Why not hold this meeting at 11.99? We are proud. We have been proud supporters of the Cuban Revolution, proud supporters of the struggle for the freedom of the five, and today I bring a message of solidarity to this gathering. We join our voices, but especially on behalf of our members, I would like to deliver a message of solidarity recognition and a salute to all the healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and lab technicians that have volunteered to go in response to the health crisis in West Africa. To our common <laughs> to our fellow healthcare workers in revolutionary Cuba, we say, we salute you. Absolutely. And we also heard Ike um, dedicate the gathering in recognition of three fighters that have passed away. And I would like the permission, Ike, to ask, to add a fourth person that should be mentioned tonight and is one of our elders in Harlem, Conrad Compañero Elombe Brava. <laughs> As we say in Latin America, Elombe, presente, ahora y siempre. Um, I guess to many of you it was a shock, as it was to me, to see an editorial in the New York Times how many of you read that editorial? I almost fell off the chair. I said, oh my God, Homeland Security now is going to put the New York Times in their terrorist list. They call for normalization of relationship with Cuba. What happened to them? But I am very glad to see that one of the voices of the ruling class in this country had joined our voices and call for what we've been calling for so many decades and the blockade against Cuba, normalization of relationships with Cuba. <laughs> the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, Amnesty International, a number of Nobel uh, Prize winners, uh, Rigoberta Menchu, Desmond Tutu, Adolfo Pérez Esquivel, José Saramago, 
gone to grass, have all sent a clear message to the United States and to President Barack Obama. 16 years is too long. Free the three comrades that are still in the jails in the United States. And while the hypocrisy, and I will call it hypocrisy of our government, that attacks the Cuban government, that attacks our sisters and brothers in Venezuela, doesn't recognize the fact, or tries to ignore because we know that they exist, that there are political prisoners right here in the very country. Mumia Abu Jamal. Oscar Lopez Rivera. In the same way that our union has called for the freedom of those two comrades, we also join our voices in telling President Obama 16 years is too damn long. Let our Cuban brothers out of jail. Let them free. In conclusion, I would like to thank the organizers of the event for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of over 300,000 members of 1199 in the state of New York, Massachusetts, Maryland, D.C., New Jersey, and Florida. And Florida, we want to deliver a clear message of solidarity and the blockade, free the three cobras, and the blockade, free the three cobras. President Obama, 16 years is too damn long. Thank you. Thank you, Australia Backers. Thank you for the strong support of the Cuban Revolution. I also thank you to 1199, who's actually um, helped us support us, build events throughout all these years. Thank you again. Moving forward, if uh, Brother you Sam Salim, Raymond Santana, could come up, uh, uh, up to the podium, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these are the Central Park Five. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, these are the Central Park Five, playing of victims, and they will have to say a few words. I almost forgot. If, if Juanita Young and Iris Baez, if you're here, please um, yes. Back in 1989, when this case first happened, it, it said that within the first two weeks of this case, there were 400 articles written about us that dissected our lives as 14 and 15 year old kids. And so from that came the, level, the, the, uh, the label of rapist, uh, wilding, wolf pack, urban terrorist, super predator. Super predator was a term that was used to put fear into the public, to tell them that our young was becoming more vicious, they were becoming more heartless, and now they were starting to, uh, to wander and to go purposely into other parts of the city to commit vicious crimes. And so this led to 41 states changing their juvenile laws. Now, I say that because when you look at it at the political scale, this is what happened to us, and it was done so that society could turn its back on us, so that society can look at us and say, you know what? These kids probably were up to no good, the same way they did the Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. Romali Grant. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we moved forward 15 years, we get exonerated, and we still receive that same type of backlash. But the difference is you guys, the public, the rallies that we have, the marches that we have, 
Justice for the Central Park Five, all those emails, Facebook posts, Twitter posts to de Blasio is what made him make the decision to settle this case and to finally end the chapter of the Central Park Five. But I tell you, once again, we call on you because now you have five brothers in Cuba who need to be free, who need justice. And so just like you still with the Central Park Five, we ask that you stand with the Cuban Five and let's deliver that justice. Justice for the Cuban Five. Yes, indeed. Justice. Yes, indeed. Stay keep up the fight, and never give up. Thank you. Definitely, I echo, this, echo the same words that Raymond has just uh, presented. And um, thank you for welcoming us here. You know, I also want to throw one more name in the pot. That is my mother, Sharon Salam. She's still fighting. You know, You know, as, as, as Raymond began to speak about our atro the atrocities that happened to us, and it just made me remember, what is it that allows for something like this to happen? Back when uh, Vietnam was going on, you know, the, the, the uh, great Muhammad Ali was known to have said, I'm not going over there to fight. You my enemy over here. If I'm going to fight, I'm going to fight over here. And then I thought about what were they doing? What, how, did, how were they getting so many people to join in this war? They were getting the people because they were dehumanizing the, Vietnam, the Vietnamese into making the world think that they were subhuman. This was the same thing that they were doing to us as members of the Central Park Five. Those 400 articles were paving the road towards this great injustice that they were going to do to us. Those 400 articles were paving the road toward these hate pieces of hate mail that my mother had been receiving over the years. This is just a, a, a drop in the bucket that I, I'm going to share some of these with you. This is just a drop in the bucket within the first few weeks of us being falsely accused of raping the Central Park jogger. They were paving the roads and getting ready, as Mayor Koch said, for the greatest crime of the century. Cool. That crime was the crime against us. Right. This, this is a letter. I mean, you know, I keep these things. I know my mom probably wants me to throw these out. This is, this is dated the 28th of April in 1989. There is no return address. It's that, you know, sent to my mom, it says, your son should be fried in oil. He and you suck. Your son should be castrated and, well, you know, I don't curse, but it's an F word right, right. that ends with an E-D, mm -hmm. up the A-S-S, -S, 24 hours a day for the rest of his life. Another one says, the Lord will punish you, sir, for what he did to that poor defenseless girl. You will also be punished for raising such an animal. He does not deserve to live, neither do you. <clears throat> Dear Yusuf, the 24th of April, 1989. Dear Yusuf, I was glad to hear you thought it was fun. So this is, you know, the, the, the way that they, paid, they painted this picture. I wrote a rap song that I presented just before they sentenced me. And I'm not going to share that with you today because it's too long. But in the rap song, I said, I, I told the cops the truth. They took my words and twisted it, and they fed it to the media. You know, they, tell they told the media, Yusef Salam said it was fun. Man. And then it goes on and says, 
the, we, 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 we were glad to hear that you thought it was fun that the woman jogger, that beating the woman jogger over the head with a lead pipe and raping her. Because that's just what I have been, wait, hold on. Is this written incorrectly or what? <laughs> because that's just what I'll be having when I blow your head off when you get out of jail. Hope to see you soon. Very last one that I want to share with you. This letter is to let you know that your name has been placed on the list of enemies of society by the Citizens Army, New York City branch. You made the decision when you became one of the pack that decided that Central Park was your arena and decided to attack and violate honest citizens who happened to be in the park. So just remember that even 30, 20 to 30 years from now, some people will never forget. And maybe the one time that you don't check your back is the one time someone just might be there to say hello. The Central Park Five stands in solidarity with the Cuban Five. Justice forever, hmm. I call it the criminal system of injustice. Straight technology. If what goes on in the streets of New York City is any indication of what's going on around the world, I mean, we already know. On the side of the cop cars when you leave out of here today, you'll see that it says courtesy, professionalism, and respect. <laughs> Some great ideals. Somebody said anything but. Exactly. Well, I'm gonna tell you what we usually receive. We get the first, we get the first letters. That's right. They usually, uh, when they come to our communities and they start unveiling their viciousness on us, we usually need CPR as we're lying on the train platforms like Oscar Grant. We usually need CPR as we're lying in our bathrooms after being shot down like with Marley Graham. We have other mothers up here who have lost their sons. And we usually need CPR as we're being rushed to the hospitals to, to save us. Well, not really, because they don't really want us to live. We can give birth to future rebel rousers. We can give birth to the freedom of this world. And this is who we are. And this is why we stand in solidarity with you all, saying justice for the, for the uh, I was going to say for the Central Park Five. <laughs> <laughs> you know, justice has been served, but it's a bittersweet justice. You know, but we're here standing in solidarity with the Cuban Five. 16 years is too long. One year is too long. One day is too long. That's right. One hour is too long. Thank you. Like you said, you can't talk about this government, but I can because I belong to this government. I can say what I want. Now, it's corrupt from the top to the bottom. Every, every step, every step in the law is corrupt. What who don't owe a, a favor pays a favor, and if the decent people, because there are a few, you could count them. Decent people. So I don't say everybody's corrupt, but I say the ones that are corrupt and they know who they are because I'm not afraid to tell them in their face that they're corrupt. If they know that somebody's doing something wrong and they don't say nothing, then you're corrupt. Because you should say not to keep your job because what's your job? A couple of dollars? You could maybe you could make it in the next place more. But I mean when I see these politicians talk and I see them that oh they always go with somebody that they put their arms around them and I'm here for you mm -hmm. as soon as they leave they leave you they're over there in a party hanging out mm -hmm. and then um you say well where's you know who's gonna help me but well, what happened nobody did nothing no 
but you told me you was gonna help me. Mm. So, I mean, when everybody would say, I'm here for you, I'm here for you. I, that good, the only one that was there was Richie Perez for me, and he told me, we're gonna take over the DA's office. And I said, let's go. What could they can do to me? They already murdered my son. Mm -hmm. So what else can happen? So we took over the DA's office, and I mean, I, I don't call it justice, because I have four boys, right? Four boys, and their crime was playing football in front of their house, mm. because I would not allow them to go further than there. Right in front of the house, they were playing football, and one of the football, one my shortest son threw the football that hit the patrol car, in, it hit the, the street and then bumped into the car. But, um, they said it hit the patrol car. Then one of the police officers got out and told him who's the leader of the gang here. So then they said, we're not a gang, we're four brothers. And then um, he came and the one, the one that said we're four brothers was my youngest, my 16 year old at the time. Then he pushed him and handcuffed him. Hmm. Then my other son said, wait a minute, we're not doing nothing. We know our own rights, we're not bothering nobody. And mind you, that when they arrested my kids, nobody in the neighborhood called the full police because there was nothing going on. Even when the police came, that they called on the radio for help, the police came. The one that came was a woman, and she said, there's nothing happening, call off the, you know, call off the call. So she called off the call because she did that. They put my son in her car, okay? She had to drive him to the, she was gonna drive him to the station, but what happened was she knows that he, he, he's dead. I'm not taking him to the station, I'm gonna take him to the hospital. And mind you, at the same time, that police officer was supposed to be, being a, he was on monitoring duty because the sergeant was supposed to be watching him murder my son, okay? The sergeant, that's why I have to say, it's corrupt from the top, I don't care, even the president right now is corrupt. So, everybody's corrupt, and I'm going to keep on saying, you're corrupt. What she didn't tell you was her name was Iris Baez. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Winnie the Young, I'm the mother of Malcolm Ferguson. My son was murdered March 1st of 2000. Being forced to, to a position that I wasn't looking for, I was out raising my five children. And one day somebody knocks on my door and says, we found your son dead in the hallway. I'm like, what? You didn't find my son dead in the hallway, you murdered my son. That's before I even knew they murdered my son. My instinct told me they did it. And sure enough, uh, they, I go upstairs and I hear on the news, cop shoots running um, homeless man across the roof. I'm like, this ain't making no sense. And then I'm trying to tell my other children that what the cops just said to me, because it didn't really hit me, that this man just <laughs> told me they murdered my son. Then after, the, after it hit me, I did. I ended up going into a respiratory arrest talking about hitting the hospital, I hit the hospital. But then I had to pray to ask God to give me strength because all my kids had was me. And I had to get back to my four other children and to give, to be there for them. And when I came back home, I still couldn't figure out what the heck just happened. My niece says to me, oh, I need to don't go to the building. I'm like, don't worry, I'm going home. But then when I laid in my bed, I couldn't lay in that bed. I got up and I remembered the, the address that they said. So I went to the building and thank God for the God because the blood that was all over that wall, all in that floor that they call themselves cleaning up. I'm like, what the? Okay. It took me two weeks to bury my son. After I buried him, I went to the DA. Cause I had some friends that were already lawyers. And I go to the DA, he tells me, why are you demanding an investigation for your drug dealing son? I'm like, what? 
Okay, now you really done hit a nerve here. He gonna tell me, I'm saying, excuse me, are you a father? He says, yeah, but that would never happen to my son. I'm like, they killed the president, what make your son any better? He thought I was crazy. So then he did his so-called investigation. He came back, he done went to the Rikers Island, to all these prisons, to get people to give him interviews that they met my son and they did all these dealings with my son. Okay, then they go, why did your son go for the cop's gun? I said, show me the fingerprints. They had to take that out too. I challenged everything they had. He still refused to go for Louis Rivera for murdering my son. The medical examiner said, my, head, my son's head was pressing against something hard. I'm like, okay, that means somebody had to hold him down. It couldn't have been one cop. Because according to his friend, they said no. They made like they were going to handcuff him. And he was down on his knees. And that's when they don't know what happened. Because they made them go back in the front of the building. They had him in the staircase of the building. They claimed this one cop. I'm like, this still ain't making no sense. Meanwhile, the lawyers are telling me, Okay, Ms. Young, why put yourself through that? Let's, let's settle this case right now. I'm like, let me tell you, I've been living all these years without your money. I'll keep living. I need to know why this cop murdered my son. The lawyers kept playing with me. They kept playing with me. So I fired him, got another one. <laughs> He's going to talk to the father, tell the father, I can't deal with her. She don't want to listen. Oh, well, I'm not going to listen. Because I raised that boy 23 years. You can't tell me what my son was doing. Here, I'm laying on my bed. I see a commercial on the TV. I go to the lawyer. He says to me, Miss Young, you seem so determined. I'm going to take your case. He took that case. He won that case. Without even the first lawyer's giving him that information. He proved my son was murdered for no reason. The cop admitted he murdered my son for no reason. Why that cop is not in jail today? Please tell me. If me or you sat on the witness stand and admit it to a murder, why is that cop still out here able to do it to another person? Come on. When the Central Park Five, the system is our problem. Like Iris said, we keep bringing back the same people. Why do you think we're still in the same position? We still allow these same people to come in the office. Mayor de Blasio, what is he really doing? Bringing Bratton back here to put the nine millimeter guns? Of course it. No, we don't need that. The Cuban files, I remember that when Malcolm first was murdered back in 2000. I'm thinking, I mean, everything is good. I made them in my mind. The attack is on the mothers. I would love to meet the Central Park. I'm sorry. You got me going. The Cuban five mothers. And let's go to Obama and say, what's your problem? We mothers are tired of y'all doing this to us. You murder innocent children. You got innocent people in jail right now. We coming from a court state to state to tell you, let them people go. What did they do? What did they do? I, I started uh, a new foundation called Mothers Cry for Justice because I hate the attack they do to mothers. I mean, come on, man. we gave birth to these kids, and y'all give us no respect. I'm asking all of y'all, mother, no mother, whoever, stand with the mother and say, stop doing it to us. Thank you.
Um, just being reminded that there is a sign-up sheet outside and we're going to ask people to please sign up uh, to learn more about this case and to participate in um, uh, the varied efforts to continue to work to free the Cuban Five. So make sure that you, you uh, sign up on the, uh, the sign-up sheet outside. Um, I just wanted to very quickly thank, um, well, Youssef and uh, uh, Raymond, thank you, um, had to leave. But, uh, so important to hear from them and um, uh, uh, Iris and uh, Juanita. Your your stories are important, and they're important that we that we make the links. We make the links between um, the case of the five, um, the Cuban five, the Central Park five, and uh, the various other cases that that um, uh, are, are so similar. And uh, so thank you, just thank you for helping to draw those links together. I want to. Put my glasses on first. Introduce our next speaker, who is uh, attorney Martin Garbus. Uh, attorney Gar um, uh, Martin Garbus is, uh, as you know, the lead attorney for the, uh, the Cuban Five, uh, representing uh, Gerardo Hernandez. He is one of the country's top uh, trial lawyers. Uh, Time Magazine called him legendary and one of the greatest trial lawyers in the country. Um, he's an expert in criminal and civil law and um, we're pleased to have him here to share uh, with us um, the work that he's been doing uh, to really, on, on a legal uh, level, to uh, address the, the case uh, of the five. Um, I could say so many more things about the uh, the great accomplishments of <laughs> Attorney Garbus, but um, I'll just ask him to come forward and uh, share with us. I'm exhausted, as we all are, mm. by the sense of tragedy, the sense of injustice, and the futility of so much conversation, and how much more has to be done. Uh, I was with Gerardo at the beginning of the month and the question was what message could I bring to you from him? I also represent a person selling, you know, Leonard Peltier. Who has been in prison for 38 years. Gerardo has been in prison for 16 years. He and the Cuban Five did the first five years in prison in solitary confinement. Peltier did about 10 years in solitary confinement. I asked Gerardo as we were sitting in jail, how do you do it? How do you keep going? How can you, Gerardo is in Victorville, California. He's the only Cuban in the prison. It's a prison basically for drug lords and defendants, it's a maximum security prison. And he's isolated in this prison, this maximum security prison, in a prison where violence occurs with frequency. I told you about solitary confinement. There's something else called a lockdown when they close all the cells because of something supposedly happened in prison. He also did five years in lockdown. That means out of 16 years, he's basically been alone for 10 years. And when I say alone, I just want to tell you a few things about what solitary confinement can mean for someone who's a political prisoner. It can mean being shackled to the foot of the bed in underclothes and kept there for months on end. It can mean having a bathroom that doesn't function and never functions. It can mean being in a cell under bathrooms that don't function, so the smell is horrendous. It can mean being in a prison, being in a prison cell that's freezing, and if there's a shower in the room, all that comes out is freezing water. It can be in a prison cell that's 100 to 4 degrees, and in that prison cell, the water in the shower only comes out extraordinarily hot. So that to put on the shower means you suffocate in the prison cell. 
It means that when you have a prison cell for one person, they put four people. And the four people desperately try at the floor of the, the, the prison cell to get air to breathe. So I said to Gerardo, I said, how do you do it? How do you get through something like this? And when he said to me, and he says it, and I way I wish you could hear him say it, and all I am here is a reporter telling you, telling you what he said to me. And I hope I can convey something of what he said to me. He says, the other people here, a lot of them feel that they did something wrong by societal standards. A lot of them feel they're unjustly convicted. A lot of them come here with a great degree of anger and fear. He says, I don't. He said, I'm in prison because I saved the lives of people in Cuba. I made a conscious decision to do something to save people's lives. I'm here under the system of justice, which for this system of justice is appropriate. Given what the law is in America, I deserve to be here, even though we all know and we'll talk about the unfairness of the trial. And the way he negotiates that prison every single day, there's people around him that are hostile. Prisons are run by a combination of guards and gangs in the prisons. And someone like Gerardo, someone like Rene, someone like Limon were isolated. They did is after the convictions, they spread them throughout the country, Arizona, Florida, California, to make it difficult for the families to see them, to make it difficult for the lawyers and the representatives of the Cuban government to see them, and to keep them totally isolated. Being in solitary confinement, in addition to being in your underclothes, which you never clean, it has no books, no paper, of course, no radio. It means not talking to anybody. It means getting food fed through the slot in the door. So the 24 hours a day, you're totally alone, not just isolated from the prison population, but you don't get phone calls, you can't see your lawyer, you can't see your family. It's a hell. Now, Amnesty International is called a torture. The United Nations uh, uh, Commission has called it torture. America is one of the countries that practices it most. I've been in prison cells in Rwanda, the Soviet Union, other places. Mm. And I must tell you mm. that the American prison system is, done, is scientifically far more torturous than in a lot of these other horrendous yeah. places. Mm. Let me tell you something about the case so that there are books and, and a good deal of information out there about it. But I think the details of the case of some significance, in the same way the case of the Central Park uh, Five, or the other cases that you've heard about, the devil, if you will, is in the details. In this particular case, on February 6, 1996, several planes were shot down over Cuban airspace by Cuban jets. And the next question comes in, after those four people in those jets, part of the Cuban planes were shot down and killed, the American government at that time, February 6, 1966, has all the information it needs. They know exactly what happened. They were tapping into the phones. They have satellite photos that show the shooting was carried down over <coughs> Cuban airspace. And if it's carried down over Cuban airspace, and other planes have intruded into that space, and the shooting is legitimate. To this day, I have not gotten the satellite photos that America had to show where the planes were at the time they were shot down. Again, if it's shot down of international waters, it's a crime, putting aside whether Gerard or the others have anything to do with the crime. If the plane is shot down over Cuba, as the Cuban satellite information indicated, then it's not a crime. <coughs> So one of the questions here is now uh, 18 years after the shoot down. We've never seen the satellite photos. Another question. The shoot down is February 6, 1996. The arrests in the case have been three and a half years later. For three and a half years, the government had all the information it could possibly want. Why did they wait three and a half years? And the answer is Alain Gonzalez. For those of you who remember, Came from Cuba. There was a whole furor about returning him home. Clinton finally returned him home. This is now 1998. You have the upcoming election between Bush and Gore. <clears throat> Everybody recognizes the pivotal state is Florida. And how does, how does Clinton then get back on the track with respect to the Democratic vote? 
prosecution has started under Clinton in 1999, three years after the event. And as I said, the arrest of three and a half years later. At the trial, the, you, you have the circuit court, the appeals court, after the conviction, say, you can't try this case in Miami. You shouldn't have tried it in Miami. Everybody was aware totally of the Gonzalez case. And the newspapers were talking about Stalin, Hitler, Lenin, Castro, and talking about an imminent invasion from Castro. The Cuban Five were listed in the newspapers as people who were softening up southern Florida for an imminent invasion. I, I will tell you about the trial itself. The trial was conducted in an atmosphere of this kind of fury and passion, in a fury up with the Clinton administration as Dr. Gonzalez. The prosecution starts, as I said, under Clinton. It finishes under George Bush. And at a time when he's just won Florida, and he's paying back for the conviction. And his prosecutor continues this other, the, the prosecution, which in so many ways, and you really, uh, this case is now, as I said, 18 years old. The detail of it is exquisite. You have to look at the books. But, but some of the things that you should know is after the first conviction, the appellate court sets aside the conviction and says, how can you try this case in Florida? If you look at what the jurors said in response to the questions of the voir dire, it's totally apparent that this was a prejudiced jury. It was a jury that felt that they were the saviors of, of Southern America, South Florida, from the imminent invasion. Now, what the judges said, there was a group called the uh, Brothers to the Rescue. And this was a group whose planes had flown into Cuba. And these are the planes that were shot down. The brothers to the rescue, according to the judge, were not supposed to say anything at all during the trial. They were put under a gag and a curfew. I'll now tell you some of the stuff that we learned after the trial, after the conviction. So in any event, the first time the Third Circuit says the conviction has to be reversed. It has to be reversed because you couldn't get a fair trial. Then it goes up to the higher court. The and the higher court says, no, forgetting about the fair trial, the conviction should be affirmed. When the convictions are affirmed, there are three judges. One judge says that all the defendants are innocent. Another judge says that if for my judgment alone, the defendants in this case are innocent, but a jury has made the decision. The third judge says that it's only circumstantial evidence with respect to the crime itself. And the question is, and it's never been a question totally resolved, can you have circumstantial evidence to sustain a murder conviction? And the technical answer is yes. So those are the three judges who decided on the case. After the case is denied in the United States Supreme Court, the Supreme Court refused to review it, we started an intensive investigation to try and get into what happened with respect to the media. Why was the media, putting aside all the other reasons why the media might be the way, the way they were. Why was the media repeating again and again and again in stories that seem similar, in stories that seem to come out of a cookie cutter, stories about, again, how these people were the lead group for an imminent invasion of Southern Florida, and again, stories that kept, kept referring to the Gulag, to Castro, to Stalin, because all 50 years, the Cold War then, in the late 1990s, was still being fought in, the Cold War, uh, in, in Florida and it was still being full of the passion that had been fought in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s. We began the investigation into the newspapers, into the TV, and into the radio. And what we learned is the American government was pouring two to three million dollars a year into the pockets of journalists who were working for papers like the Miami Herald, CBS, NBC. And what we learned was as follows. The judge had said that she didn't want to sequester the jury but she didn't want the community to know the families of the judges, uh, of the jurors. She didn't want the families to, to be exposed because everybody expected the jurors to come in and return a verdict. So she wanted to insulate, if she could, the jurors from that kind of pressure. Of course she couldn't do it, but she tried to do it by saying, don't publicize their names, don't publicize their pictures. What really happened was, those pictures kept appearing on television. Their pictures kept appearing on television. Reporters followed them out to their cars. You could see their license plates. And reporters followed them to their work, work, uh, to their work sites. 
and took pictures outside their houses of they and their children. And the judge was frustrated, but the judge did not know, and which we did not know until several years ago, that these people who were breaking the, the code of keeping the jurors secret were paid for by the United States government. When the Miami Herald found out that their staff had been on the payroll of the government, as well as the Miami Herald, they fired six reporters. When CBS found out about it, they fired reporters. So that at this point in time, and none of this, none of this, was known at the time of the trial. So what you saw was vast American resources, and the numbers go far beyond the numbers I've told you, because it comes in through all different ways. It comes in through Radio Marti, which is $16 million a year. It could, Radio Marti broadcast down in Florida. It couldn't get into Cuba because Cuba blocked it out. So what Radio Marti did is they, they turned the whole focus of the $16 million each year into Southern Florida, into the people who, who were involved with the jurors, into some of the jurors themselves. So you had $16 million a year coming in solely from Radio Marti. You had three to four million dollars being interspersed throughout other people. After the time, Miami Herald and the Washington Post and the New York Times wrote about it, there was a call to have the courts reconsider the case. The court at that time took a pass and said, let's have further investigation. Let's get further documents. Let's see how much there really is. And we spent three years just going into the records of the media and the files at this point needed to say, are many, many times this size, three and four times this size. All this information has, was presented to the court two years ago. Where we are now is we're waiting for the court to make a decision. It is incredible that a judge can sit for two years on a case with this kind of evidence with no decision forthcoming. In October, I met with several congressmen, uh, uh, Senator Leahy, and uh, uh, several uh, uh, senators to form a committee to issue a statement concerning this particular case, to ask Obama to grant clemency. And this particular group of senators, they're going to really become more active after the election, will be about 30 members of the House, about six senators, and it will be a permanent voice going through all this media stuff and just saying this trial was fundamentally unfair. It was one of the most outrageous convictions in American history. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Marcus. Thank you for the story. Let's see what you can find. And just like everybody else here, we continue that same story from the Cuban Five to Mumia Abu Jamal, from Leonard Peltier. We have to continue that same story. Before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to read a solidarity message that we wrote to uh, Second International Tri-Continental Solidarity Council to Free the Cuban Bar Barisal, Bangladesh. The, the July 26 coalition extends warm greetings of international solidarity to the second international tri-continental solidarity conference to free the Cuban five. We join with you and thousands around the world in calling the US government to free Antonio Guerrero, Geraldo Hernandez, Ramon Labanino, who face draconian sentences, have already been behind bars for more than 16 years. We salute Rene Gonzalez and Fernando Gonzalez, who from the moment they return home to Cuba, have served every day of the sentence, have used every opportunity to involve others in fight, win the releases of these three imprisoned brothers. The facts about the US government's frame up of the Cuban Five, and above all the dignity, courage, and the integrity of these five men is gaining them support among more and more people worldwide. As you gather this weekend in Barisal, we are holding a public meeting in New York City to tell the truth about the five. Your international conference in Bangladesh will be another step along the road of broadening the fight worldwide to bring all five 
to bring back all five of our prison brothers home to Cuba. Together with you, we say, free the Cuban Five now. Our next, our next speaker is a John Jay student from the organization of the People Power Movement. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me join, on, join me, Claudio Mendoza. I can't hold this. It's the first time that I talk in front of a large audience like this. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> okay. My name is Claudia Mendoza, and I would like to welcome you all to John Jay. I'm a fourth year student here studying political science and Latin American studies with a complete focus on justice. I'm also a member of People Power Movement, Poder Movimiento, <laughs> Movimiento Poder Popular, an organization that is dedicated to fundamental social change through education, agitation, and organization. I would like to thank Ike for supporting our events and for inviting us to be a part of this conversation. I would also like to thank Father Luis Barrios, my first mentor in the struggle for liberation and justice, for invi inviting me to speak on behalf of the students here at John Jay. I would also like to thank Joe Kay, author of the book, The Crime of Impunity and the Crime of Punishment, and another great mentor of mine, whom I will be citing frequently throughout this speech. And I already understand that many of us here, um, we already have a clear understanding of the injustice that is the case of the Cuban Five, and therefore I will not be elaborating on any specific details regarding the case. Rather, I will attempt to show the systematic implications of this case and how this case is one of thousands that have plagued this country ever since its inception. I find it absolutely impossible to address the joint case of René, Antonio, Fernando, Geraldo, and Ramon, or any others like them, without first addressing the inconsistencies that purposefully dominate the so-called greatest democracy in the world. As Joe Kay points out in his book, the United States claims that it does not now, nor has it ever had political prisoners, because according to the Constitution, people are not prosecuted for engaging in and peaceful political activities, like, let's say, peacefully invest investigating possible terrorist attacks on your native country, or advocating for the independence of your colonized island, or for fighting against racism, poverty, inequality, oppression, and exploitation on US soil and abroad. However, I believe that we are all capable of seeing that the US's pretended use of the Constitution as a safety net for equal treatment in the US is false and has been deemed problematic for centuries. Let's not, <laughs> let's not ignore that this is the same document that legalizes and justifies slavery in the 21st century, stating that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, shall exist in the US. Do we not question why it is that the majority of people who fall victim to mass incarceration are primarily people of color? And I will argue that all incarcerated people of color are inherently political prisoners, both groups whose mere existence is a threat to the sustainability of this so-called democracy. Joe says it best in his book. Our criminal justice system is cruel, racist, and barbaric because it is there to protect a social system that is cruel, racist, and barbaric. <laughs> the US government makes sure that it dots its I's and crosses its T's in terms of formal procedures involving political defendants because after all, it has to maintain its image as the fairest criminal justice system in the world. But in reality, there's a different set of rules for handling cases that pertain to political prisoners, rules which basically throw out all the supposed con constitutional guarantees and requirements of a fair trial. For example, in the case of the Cuban Five, 
The provision for a speedy trial was ignored. The provision for an unbiased jury was ignored. The provision for a neutral venue was ignored. The defendants were locked away in solitary confinement, thus, thus making it virtually impossible for them to assist in their own defense. They allowed adverse pretrial publicity, which was paid by the government, by the US government. And they refused to allow in evidence that would give the, the defendants context for their actions. Further details on this, if you want further details on this, you can check out the book. Um, you can check out the book, The Perfect Storm, The Case of the Cuban Five. Um, um, in his book, Joe Kay also describes, I'm sorry, like I've read the book and that's where I got lost. <laughs> um, he also describes that those who dare challenge the social system are punished with special vindictiveness for no other reason than to serve as an object lesson, a warning of dire consequences of militancy in the cause of freedom and social justice. What can be more enraging and provocative to those who rule than the notion of social justice? As I come to a close, I will ask you what you believe to be your responsibility as a student, professional, worker, parent, etc. in the struggle for social justice. Do we continue to isolate these cases as has been done over the decades, often to be reversed overnight? Or do we commit ourselves to fundamentally changing the criminal justice system? A system which functions to enforce the complete economic and social domination of a ruling class? I thank you all very much for having me. But again, before I close, let us honor all those who have been languishing in inhumane conditions in hopes of one day seeing a just society. With special recognition to Rene Gonzalez, Antonio Guerrero, Fernando Gonzalez, Geraldo Hernandez, Ramon Labanic Nino, along with Mumia Bujama, Oscar Lopez Rivera, Leonard Potier, Bradley Manning, and the men and the men and women of the Move Eight, and all others too numerous to name. All power to the people. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> thank you all. Well, I just want to say thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, just remember, ladies and gentlemen, that this is a struggle. Again, I have to really emphasize and really stress it that we have to continue the fight. We cannot back down. And we have to free all political prisoners. Oh, yeah. All. Yeah. It's wrong what we do. Make sure to um, sign the mailing list on your way out. Uh, stay tuned for more events like this, informational events, where we will be speaking about the case of the five, making links between uh, the various political prisoners. Thank you for being here. Good night. <laughs> Oh, she was great. Thank <laughs> you.